And welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged. This is a, a really special podcast because in just a little bit, we are going to celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ. At least we as, as Western Christians, by and large, celebrate December 25th as the time of incarnation. And then the Eastern Christians follow that up just about two weeks later with, again, a celebration of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This is an amazing celebration because we're celebrating the great exchange. What I'm talking about here is Christ taking on our humanity so that we might become partakers, as St. Peter put it, partakers of the divine nature. And really, this is what I'm talking about when I I emphasize truth matters, life matters more. Jesus, you know, Jesus declared himself not only to be the way to the Father, but the truth and the life outside the truth kept by the whole church, personal experience would, well, it'd be deprived of all certainty. And yet, just as there can be no life without truth, so too, there can be no truth without life. And as such, the life that matters more is a realm largely inaccessible to our human apprehensions of truth. It involves a mystery that you can experience for yourself in the context of the church. And while the divine incomprehensibility of the life that matters more is not a prohibition upon knowledge, it is the transcending of knowledge the transcending of all philosophical speculation. Can you really imagine God taking on flesh? Well, that's precisely what we say every single Sunday when we recite the creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not created, of one essence with the Father through whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became man. As Christians, this is what we affirm about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we do so Sunday by Sunday, liturgy by liturgy. This, however, according to the famed author Dan Brown, is simply false. I don't know if you remember his book. It's wildly popular. It's called The Da Vinci Code. It's a book in which the incarnation, well, is is rendered a fake and a fable. And we're told that Dan Brown is a brilliant historian. I remember reading the reviews of his book, Library Journal, called his book a compelling blend of history and page-turning suspense. 
they called it a masterpiece that, that ought to be mandatory reading. Publishers Weekly said it was an exhaustively researched page turner. And then there was Nelson DeMille who christened it pure genius. Well, what is this genius? Well, Dan Brown, he, he eviscerates the Nicene Creed that I just quoted a part of. He said that, that nothing in the Christian faith is original. Everything from the incarnation of our Lord to his resurrection, his ascension, according to Dan Brown, is taken from pagan mystery religions. Simply stated, what we will celebrate this Christmas, according to Dan Brown, is a ripoff. As I made plain in a book that I wrote, a book that I co-authored with Professor Paul Meyer, he is a professor of ancient history, the book we titled The Da Vinci Code, Fact or Fiction. As I said in that book, his contention about the incarnation being a ripoff is hardly unique. The past four decades have seen, well, have seen an outpouring of sensationalistic books, of movies, of television specials in which Jesus and the true origins of Christianity are barely recognizable. We called this the Jesus game. Here's how it's played. You begin with a general sketch of Jesus on the basis of the Gospels, and then you distort it as much as you please. You add clashing colors, you paint in, you paint in a bizarre background, and then you add episodes to the life of Christ that could not possibly have happened. And if the end result still faintly resembles the Jesus of the New Testament, you lose. But, but if you come up with a radically different and above all sensational portrait of Jesus, you win. The Jesus game has been played ever since the pagan philosopher Celsus first helped set up the rules of the second century AD, but it has never played with such great enthusiasm. Let me give you a case in point. Nobel laureate W.B. Yeats. According to Yeats, the incarnation of Jesus Christ directly parallels the Greek mythology of Leda and the Swan. Here's kind of how he puts it, my paraphrase. As Zeus, having taken on the form of a swan, had intercourse with the Virgin Leda. So the Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary in the form of a dove. In both scenes, according to Yeats, divinities by impregnating mortal women intervene in and, and then transform cultural history. Purveyors of this kind of, well, I'll call it mythology, what they do is they employ biblical language and then they go to great lengths to concoct commonalities. The alleged similarities as well as the terminology that's used to communicate these similarities are clearly exaggerated. I say that because parallels between the incarnation of Helen of Troy and the incarnation of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and not to mention the terminology that's used to communicate those parallels, are an obvious stretch. And sadly for the mystery religions, this is as good as it gets. In fact, the reason the mystery religions are so named is that they directly involve secret esoteric practices and initiation rites. Far from being rooted in history and evidence, 
the mysteries revel in hype and emotionalism. Adherents not only worshipped various pagan deities, but they also frequently embraced aspects of competing mystery religions, and that while continuing to worship within their own cultic constructs. But not Christianity. Converts to Christ always place their faith solely in the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so those with a truly open mind should resist rejecting the incarnation prior to examination. We believe in miracles, and to believe in miracles in an age of scientific enlightenment doesn't go against the fact. It coheres with the fact. Not only the fact of incarnation, but the facts of the universe in which we live. It's so important in light of the way that the incarnation is being devalued that you and I as Christians are always ready always ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us. And we need to do that with gentleness and with respect. Now, that's not my admonition. That admonition comes directly from St. Peter in the words of Scripture. Miracles are not only possible in the Christian worldview, but they're necessary in order to make sense of the universe in which we live. And I say that because, well, because according to modern science, the universe not only had a beginning, but the universe is unfathomably fine-tuned to support life. And not only that, but the origin of life, information in the genetic code, irreducible complexity in biological systems, and even even the phenomenon of the, the human mind pose intractable difficulties for merely natural explanations. And therefore, and therefore reason forces us to look beyond the natural world to a supernatural designer who miraculously intervenes in the affairs of his created handiwork. Let me put that another way. If we're willing to believe that God created the heavens and the earth, we should have no problem whatsoever accepting his incarnation in time and space. Now, While many issues surrounding incarnation, issues like the precise modes of interaction between Christ's divine nature and his human nature transcend human understanding, the doctrine of the incarnation, and it is a doctrine, does not transgress the laws of logic. To understand the logical coherence of incarnation, You and I, particularly now in light of of celebrating Christmas, we, we must first consider human beings as icons of God. Because God created humanity in his own image, the essential properties of human nature are not inconsistent with the divine nature. Now, while the notion of Zeus becoming a swan, as I talked about before the break, is is self-evidently absurd, the reality that God became man is not. Moreover, it is more than intoxicating to reflect on the reality that as Christ is incarnate in the image of humankind, so humanity in Christ is, but we're being, being refashioned in the image of God. Those in Christ become by grace what the Son of God is by nature. We become children of God, His 
divinity interpenetrating our humanity. Suffice it to say, when you and I encounter those who, who cast aspersions on the miraculous nature of Christ coming in flesh, we would do well to remember once again that it is our responsibility to use well-reasoned answers as springboards or well, as opportunities to demonstrate that the historical account of Christ's incarnation is not blind faith, but rather faith founded on a refutable fact. I want to think back to maybe past Christmas celebrations and think about what you were thinking about at that time. Did you ever contemplate how great this mystery is? Well, if you didn't in the past, do so now. Because the more you contemplate the mystery of God becoming man, the more staggered your imagination will be. The thought, the very thought that the one who spoke and trillions of galaxies leapt into existence should cloak himself in our humanity is actually beyond our comprehension. To imagine that the one who knit you together in your mother's womb would himself inhabit Mary's temple? That boggles the mind. And yet this is precisely what Christianity proffers. A creator beyond all comprehension who has revealed himself in incarnation. I'm thinking right now about the words of the, the beloved apostle, St. John, who said that the Christ who was with God and who was God became flesh. He dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. <laughs> if you think about Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they would say that this is the height of absurdity. Muslim philosophers would say that this is blasphemous. God begitteth not, they say, nor is he begotten. And, and modern thinkers are similarly persuaded. I've often talked about New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof. He sees the incarnation as, well, as reflective of the way American Christianity is becoming less intellectual and more, more mystical over time. He, he once said that the heart is a wonderful organ, but so is the brain. So he smirks at incarnation and then... And then he swallows the odd predilection that nothing creates everything. Those who have a truly open mind must resist this kind of obscurantism. Miracles such as the Incarnation, as I said earlier, are not only possible, but they're necessary to make sense of the universe. Thinking otherwise is tantamount to the implausible contention that life sprang from non-life, that the life that sprang from non-life produced metaphysical realities, including mind and morals, that the universe in all of its incomprehensible magnitude is but, but a function of time and happenstance. And that is evolutionary behemoth Carl Sagan once put it. We live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Or, to put it in the vernacular of Bill Nye, the science guy, I'm a speck on a speck orbiting a speck among other specks among still other specks in the middle of specklessness. I'm insignificant, said Bill Nye. I suck. 
And he said that because for Sagan and Bill Nye the Science Guy, our significance is nothing more than a mirage. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by what Carl Sagan described as a, a, a point of pale light. Our planet is just a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Again, that the perspective of naturalists in our epic of time. But they're wrong. Because there is a hint. In fact, far more than a hint. The heavens quite literally shout. You know, King David said that the the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they, they display knowledge. There's no speech says King David, no language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to the ends of the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. So far from impinging on our significance, the vastness of the universe intensifies our significance. Your significance, my significance, our significance is found in the reality that Christ took on our humanity. That's what we're talking about at Christmas. Incarnation, Christ taking on flesh. That God was was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, he by whom all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, created the vastness of the universe for you and I. For you and I, to explore throughout eternity. Think about this. If the length of our days were a mere 70 or 80 years, we might rightly say that we're but specks in the middle of specklessness. But you and I, in reality, are created for eternity an eternity of continuous new horizons, an eternity of constant growth, an eternity of, of, well, incomprehensible development. By nature, you and I are finite. And of course, that is how it always will be. And therefore, we will never come to an end of learning. We will never come to an end of exploration. We will never come to an end of exhilarating new horizons, new galaxies. Not only that, but what we now merely apprehend, what we, we merely apprehend about, about the incarnate Christ, we will spend an eternity seeking to comprehend. Imagine that. Imagine forever exploring the depths of God's love, His wisdom, His his holiness. Imagine forever growing in our capacities to fathom His immensity, His immutability, His incomprehensibility. Imagine forever seeking to grasp his ineffability. Imagine that that we all with unveiled faces will 
will forever contemplate the Lord's glory. And that, as we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, imagine, imagine, imagine. Maybe as I say those words, a contrary refrain is stuck in your head. I know it is sometimes stuck in mine. It's the refrain of John Lennon. He imagined a world of people living only for today. But you and I as Christians imagine a far more intoxicating reality. We imagine a universe liberated from its bondage to decay. Imagine learning, growing, developing without error. Imagine exploring the inexhaustible, the one who spoke and the universe leapt into existence. Imagine, imagine there really is a heaven. It's easy if you try. You know, those who, who, who tout our specklessness, those who tout the, the great enveloping cosmic dark, they're really like children who are addicted to virtual reality. And that while all around us, there's a world of realism. There's a world of relationships left begging to be explored. Post-enlightenment thinkers, they have become such wretched flatlanders. They're stuck in the, the psycho-epistemological cocoons of their own fundamentalism. Far from considering the possibility that they might step through the wardrobe into Narnia, they mindlessly mouth Sagan's mantra. Remember, he made it famous. He said, the cosmos is, is all that is or ever was or, or ever will be. But imagine this. God became man, that man might become God. The echo of the Holy Fathers, of the Holy Church, that echo pounds at our psyches and it seeks to rid us of our obscurantism. Christ invaded time and space. He took on our humanity. Why? That we might experience the perichoretic movement, the divine dance that is inherent to the divinization of Christ's flesh. A movement, a dance, a divine dance undeniably commenced by the divine nature of the Logos who united our nature to himself in a single hypostasis. And that, and that without division and without confusion, and a reciprocal movement, the image returns to the archetype, who in turn imparts to it divine life. One of my favorite fathers of the faith, Maximus the Confessor, as well as Athanasius, Irenaeus, and, and a great cloud of witnesses that even now surround us. For those great fathers, the whole of the human being, they pointed out, is interpenetrated by the whole of God and becomes all that God is, of course, excluding identity of essence. The human being receives to itself the whole of God and as a prize for ascending to God, inherits God himself. The movement of all of creation from the moment that God made the heavens and the earth to the moment he created man in his own image and likeness is a movement towards this goal. For this is the very end for which you and I have been created that we might become, as St. Peter put it, partakers of the divine nature, 
Again, this is the great exchange. Christ lowers himself to humanity so that we might rise up and become become partakers of the divine nature. It is for the sake of deification that all existing things are constituted and abide, and all non-existing things are brought into being and come into being. While eternity awaits the effulgence of our deification, even now, we may take hold of the life that is truly life, and in doing so, experience the life that matters more. And so on the eve of this, another Christian celebration that we we elevate this Christmas celebration. I once again think of our Lord's words, the words concerning the reason that he condescended to cloak himself in human flesh. He gave us that reason. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. And so Jesus is is the very embodiment of salvation. In fact, as I've pointed out many, many times during the course of my ministry, the Greek form of the Hebrew Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation. St. Paul put it this way, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the first. Those are words I repeat in liturgy every time I partake of the pure body and the precious blood of our Savior. I believe and confess, Lord, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came into the world to save sinners, of whom I I am the first. As previously expressed, salvation means far more than being saved from sin. We're saved for sonship, to be divinely adopted sons and daughters of God. Forgiveness. Well, forgiveness is the precondition for God's greater gift, the gift that will will last beyond our death, the gift of divine life. And therefore, it can be rightly said that we who were shipwrecked, we not only look forward to the port of salvation, but the resumption of a journey whose sole goal is union with God. You and I are destined for for fellowship in the Holy Trinity, sharing in the life of God as God has, has shared in our humanity. This, once again, is why I not only say truth matters, but life matters more. The reason we rejoice we, we celebrate Christmas is that the baby born to Mary on that first advent was no ordinary child. He is the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of Emmanuel, of God with us. This is something explicated by, by the fathers of the church, fathers that that we remember and we revere because they gave us a right understanding of what the Bible communicates when it communicates the glorious reality of Christ's incarnation. The celebration of Christmas is something that that we need to focus in on. It is so critical because when we think of of incarnation, we think of the whole panoply of Christian truth ultimately culminating in our resurrection. We will one day be resurrected immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. When Jesus appears a second time, we will be 
raised. Raised to the condition that we all long for. The condition of forever being rid of sin and Satan. Of this veil of tears. And this is a reality we accept not through blind faith, but rather by faith in irrefutable fact. I think of Maximus the Confessor, one of my favorites. For the Father's incarnation and deification, they say, correspond to one another. They they mutually imply each other. God descends to the world and becomes man. And man is raised toward divine fullness and becomes God, excluding, of course, identity of essence. And this is because this union of two natures, the divine and the human, has been determined in the eternal counsel of God, and because it is the final end for which the world has been been created out of nothing. I want to talk about how to achieve the salvation for which we are destined. To achieve this, it is necessary to break through a triple barrier. The triple barrier of which Nicholas Cabasius, who was a contemporary of Gregory Palamas, wrote about in a remarkable work worth reading each year. It's titled The Life in Christ. In this work, He says that the Lord allowed men separated from God by the triple barrier of nature, sin, and death to be fully possessed of him and to be directly united to him. And that by the fact that he has set aside each barrier in turn. The barrier of nature by his incarnation, the barrier of sin by his death, and the barrier of death by his resurrection. The first barrier, that, that of a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life, is forever removed by Christ's virgin birth. Furthermore, as Christ set aside the first of the triple barriers by his incarnation, so too he set aside the second by his death. As the anthropus, as the, the God-man, the spotless Lamb of God, well, he lived a perfectly sinless human life and he died a sinner's death to sufficiently atone once for all for the sins of humanity. Without both natures, Christ's payment would have been insufficient. As God, his sacrifice was sufficient to provide redemption for the sins of humankind as man. He did what the first Adam failed to do. So as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And thus through his death, that second barrier, the barrier of sin, is forever set aside. And then finally the sting of death itself The third, the final barrier, is forever voided to the resurrection that I alluded to earlier. Through through resurrection, the sting of death has been forever swallowed up in victory. Isaiah prophetically looked forward toward the resurrection of a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. And he looked forward to that as the earnest of our resurrection on the last day. Isaiah's prophecy is pregnant with the promise of a new birth. Your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up. Shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. It is from the dust that God created humankind. It is to the dust that humankind returns. And yet, and yet it is also from the dust 
that our DNA emerges as the pattern for resurrected bodies. The resurrection of Israel points forward to the restoration of true Israel. I'm talking about you and I. It looks forward to the restoration of true Israel, which is the earnest of, of every individual who realizes in Emmanuel the promise of resurrection from the dead. Jesus, who, who fulfills the entire mosaic of Old Testament resurrection prophecies, left absolutely no doubt about his coming resurrection. Do not be amazed at this, said Jesus, for, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will, will rise to be condemned. If Christ had not himself been resurrected, the promise that he will resurrect dry bones and scattered graves, will it be as empty as the tomb guaranteeing its fulfillment? What humanity would have attained by ascending to the Shekinah glory of God, God achieved by descending to humanity. And thus the triple barrier, the barrier that separates us from God, that of nature, sin, and death, is forever overcome by Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, who is the unique superstar who emerged through the doorway of Old Testament prophecy. You can know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ, who came in this celebration of Christmas, will not only save us, but resurrect us. So long for now.